Uh, I'm David James, uh, and I'd like to welcome you to this Institution of Engineering and Technology Sussex Network talk. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Kerr Anderson, who is uh, Head of Radio and Performance at uh, Vodafone. Now, Kerr's been in the mobile industry for 31 years, uh, beginning as one of the first employees of One to One. He's led radio design and optimization teams in both T-Mobile and O2 before moving to O2's technology strategy team, where he developed the blueprint for the cornerstone network sharing agreement between O2 and Vodafone. After leaving O2 in 2012, Kerr spent three years with City Fiber, developing their business with the mobile industry before joining Vodafone in late 2015 as head of network for London, where he has led considerable network developments, placing Vodafone in quite a leading position in London. In 2020, Kerr took up the role of head of radio and performance, and uh, that's where he is now. Now, um, my old uh, iPhone uh, only receives uh, uh, 3G, um, but I'm certainly interested in 5G as a, an enabling technology. So I'm really looking forward to what Kerr has to say. Well, thank you for inviting me along uh, this evening to, to talk to you about, uh, about 5G. Um, I've, I've been in this industry, as, as David said, for, for 31 years now. And, and although the, the slides you're going to see this evening are, are branded as Vodafone, it's, it's in no way an attempt for me to plug Vodafone. It's just that this is my, this is my employer currently. This is my experience of 5G. Um, and, and, and this is where, um, you know, I've, I've learned about, about this current technology. So apologies for the, for the branding on the slides. Um, I, I, I won't be, I won't be plugging Vodafone. It's, um, it's very much trying to take you through the, the journey of, uh, of how we got to 5G. So I'll, I'll talk about that initially. Um, how we've gone from from 1G um, to 5G. Um, I'll I'll talk about that in a second, and then I've I've got a, a video which um, takes you through that journey in a bit more eloquently than than I can I can describe. So, if I go to my first slide. Just as a as a recap on um, uh, on how we got here, the first generation of mobile phones started in the mid mid nineteen eighties in in the UK. Um, of course, these were analog devices. Um, they were pretty big. They were pretty heavy. Uh, they consumed a lot of battery. They were extremely expensive to use. I think I think they were something like a pound a minute. I think for a phone call. Um, and of course, it was an analog device. When we came into the 90s, um, we had the first generation of digital mobile phones, which was termed 2G. Um, this was the first time we were actually able to send any kind of data, um, which started off as SMS or text messages, as they're, as they're known. Uh, SMS stands for short message service. Uh, and there was also the ability to send picture messages. In, uh, at the turn of the century in 2000s, um, we, we moved into a world of 3G. And, and this was really where um, we've, we started to see data getting consumed. Um, it was the first, uh, the first dongles actually appeared on 3G where you were able to connect your laptop or your computer to a, to a mobile network and actually do some, um, some connect to the internet or, or work remotely from from the office um, and although 3g data was uh, was was pretty slow certainly by today's standards it was it was probably sufficient really to to give people a, a feeling for for the capabilities of of what mobile could uh, could all could offer and of course we had video calling back and back in those days although strangely there was no real uh, uptake on on video calling back back in those days as we then progressed into the world of 4G in, in 2013, 
um, we really started to see this as the age of video um, and and bringing the um, the internet to to mobile phones. People were starting to 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 use it far more extensively, connecting it to laptops. Um, we started seeing uh, um, you know, a lot more happening in the world of video, people starting to stream video, people starting to watch TV. Um, and, and this was all due to an increasing capability on 4G. And of course, now we're in a world of 5G. It's still early days for 5G, of course. Um, 5G launched in the UK in 2019. Um, I think actually it was EE's two year anniversary of their launch just last week, I think I saw, I read somewhere. Um, and it's, uh, it's two years since Vodafone launched uh, next month. Um, this has been launched initially really in the, in the urban areas and, and major towns and cities, um, but we'll start to see that, that grow uh, over, the, over the coming years, especially after the, um, the recent options of the low band spectrum, which will allow the, um, the networks to provide coverage in more rural areas. So uh, before I go any further, I just want to play a short video. It's about four minutes long, um, which really just takes you through the evolution uh, from, from where we started to where we are now. Five G is just around the corner, and history shows us that about every ten years, mobile telecommunications evolve to the next generation. The 80s gave us the first analog mobile phone network, meaning we could make voice calls on the move without looking for a public payphone. A decade later, the 90s gave us 2G, the first digital mobile phone network. Phones were smaller and enabled us not only to speak on the move, but send text messages too. Fast forward to the millennium and you have 3G. This allowed us not only to make calls and send text messages on our mobiles, but surf the web too. 3G also gave us the capacity to make video calling possible. You could ditch the dial-up and go wireless by simply slotting a data card into your laptop. Progress was definitely being made. The explosion of the smartphone came towards the end of 2012, and luckily so did 4G LTE, long-term evolution. This type of 4G gave us high-speed data streaming, letting us make video calls straight from our mobile, stream movies on the go, as well as keeping up with our friends on social media. All this could be done much quicker than using 3G. Six years later, and we have 4G Evolution, the first step towards 5G. This is simply an enhanced version of 4G LTE, which means you can get faster data speeds on the go, as well as less time lag when you make video calls or run online gaming, known as latency. This is where the real fun begins. 5G will be able to handle huge amounts of data and send it from one place to another extremely quickly, four times quicker to be precise. And the icing on the cake, there will be almost no time lag or latency. 5G will be the platform for big advances in technology, including artificial intelligence, machine learning, internet of things, robotics, connected cities, and even self-driving cars. Some of this may seem a little far-fetched, but it's the future, and it all starts with 5G. So, how will we implement 5G? We'll install 5G as a layer on top of our existing 4G network. This is known as non-standalone architecture and will let us bring 5G to our customers early. To do this, we'll need to add new antennas to our sites and carry out lots of technical upgrade work to our existing 4G network behind the scenes. Now for the technical bit. Our initial installment of 5G will be in a 3.5 GHz band using massive MIMO technology. Wow. I think we need to break this down. Let's start with 3.5 GHz. Now, this refers to the frequency spectrum that we've just acquired. We won a staggering 50 MHz of this spectrum at the Ofcom auction in April, more than anyone else. Let's use a real-life analogy to explain spectrum further. Spectrum is like a road. It connects two places, and the data that we transport between them are the cars. And the more spectrum you have, the wider your road is, meaning more cars or data can pass through. For 2G and 3G, they have a single input, single output way of transmitting data, which is basically like having one lane of traffic. 4G uses MIMO, which is multiple input, multiple output. It's like having two roads side by side. Whereas 5G runs on massive MIMO, 
Essentially, it's like opening up more lanes on a motorway, 64 lanes to be precise. And it gets better. Massive MIMO technology also steers multiple lanes of traffic to multiple users. This is known as beamforming. Now all of this is fantastic and has great benefits for us and our customers, including enhanced mobile broadband, giving customers higher data speeds on the go, four times faster to be precise, meaning they'll be able to stream films much quicker than they can now. More reliability and lower latency, or time lag as we explored earlier, which means when customers are online gaming with their mates, they'll have a seamless connection. Time lag will be reduced by a staggering 80%, and it will open up exciting opportunities for IoT, Internet of Things, which could be anything from cars monitoring tire pressure and sending you a text message if they get low, through to your oven sending you a message if you leave it switched on. Now, we're still working on our own plan for IoT, but it sure does give us an opportunity to explore some exciting things. We aim to be the leader in 5G. So watch this space. A little bit concerned I got a message saying that my internet connection was unstable, so uh, hopefully it will hold out as we... Uh, um as we as we continue um i thought um given that i was talking to members of the iet that it would be useful to talk about some of the practicalities of what's involved in in building um a 5g network and um what happens in the background so what we have to do in terms of rolling out 5G is, is that we basically go to every single cell site and we have to re-engineer those, those cell sites. Now, that uh, in terms of, of physical activity is, um, is, is quite a bit of work, but, but before we even start any of that work, we have to make sure that we've got all of, all of the rights um, to do this work with the landlord, that we've got planning permission, um, and that our leases are are compatible with with the work that, that we want to do. So, before we can even even set foot on site, we have to make sure that that we have uh, an appropriate lease in place, which allows us to do everything that we want to do. Um, the first thing that happens is we do a thing called an MSV. What is that? What is an MSV? It's a multi-skilled visit. Uh, that means that we send structural engineers, radio planners, um, uh, various various people to to the to the cell site to um, to look at where do we want to place the equipment, where do we want to place the antennas. Um, how do we want to route the, the, the feeder cables? How do we want to route the power if we need to route power in there? Um, if it's a, if it's a, if it's connected the, the back hole, uh, we need to look for a route for for connecting the back hole. Now, most sites will be existing cell sites, so a lot of that will be in place already. But we still have to go to site, uh, visit all of uh, visit and and draw up all of these schematics. What's really interesting is that over the for the last um, year and a bit now, we've been um, we've been looking at ways of of doing this remotely um, by using drawings, um, and um, more recently we've started using drones to to actually visit cell sites and uh, and capture all the all the imagery that we need um, from from drone from drones, um, which allows us to to draw up the the drawings for for construction and and for the landlord. Um, 5G has has brought some some new challenges for us, though, because the 5G antenna that that we've been rolling out initially is a is a, a massive what's called a massive MIMO panel. Um, it's quite a, a large, complex piece of electronics, um, which also has the has the radios built into the antenna, um, and as a consequence, it, it weighs 60 kilograms. Now, um, 60 kilograms isn't a particularly easy item to carry to site. In fact, it's impossible to carry to site. Um, so we need cranes or we need scaffolding um, or we need cherry pickers. Um, but but you know, we're, we're challenged in how we actually get those antennas onto the roof and, and secured. And because they're so heavy, we also need to conduct fairly intrusive um, 
GDCs, which is basically a structural check on the buildings to make sure that they can take the weight and the wind loading of the antennas. Um, so quite a lot of work is involved in making sure that all the cell sites are capable of accepting these new antennas. Um, not just from, from, uh, from a structural point of view, but also from, from a radio point of view, because we want to make sure that these antennas are placed uh, correctly on the building such that um, we can get the, um, uh, get the coverage that, that we want from, from those uh, antennas. So what do, I, what do I mean by that? Well, we need to make sure that the, the antennas are placed right on the edge of the building, because if we don't put them on the edge of the building, there's a, there's a danger that the antenna beams will clip the side of the building and they'll not be able to, to realize their full potential. Not only, if the, not only that, but if the antennas are clipping the edge of the building or they're clipping some part of the structure, um, there will be a reflection into the antenna and then we'll end up with, with all sorts of interference problems. So it's really, really important that the antennas are placed as close as we can to the edge of the building, that they're unobstructive and that we've got plenty of space both vertically and horizontally for the beam steering um, to, to work correctly and be able to steer the beam to where the, the, the users are. Now, as we've been going through um, the different generations of technology, um, we've, we've adopted a, a, a whole manner of different antenna technology solutions um, where the very early days we started off with multiple antennas offering spatial diversity, which improved um, the, the, the receive uplink. Um, antenna technology has moved considerably from those early days and we now have um, antennas which, which don't require spatial diversity and all of the, the diversity is achieved within, within a single antenna. But as we've gone from 2G to 3G to 4G and now to 5G, we've, we've had to continue to um, support all of the legacy technologies on site. So whilst 1G is gone now, thankfully, we don't need to worry about 1G, we still have a 2G network to run, we have a 3G network to run, a 4G network to run and a 5G network to run. And all of those networks are operating on, on different frequencies. Um, some frequencies are actually active on more than one technology. Um, and so we've, we've had to evolve our antenna design um, to uh, accommodate the ever-growing need of, of the cell site to, to support multiple technologies. Um, now, we've also had to do that with the space available um, on site. Uh, and also within the constraints that our lease would allow. Um, and so we've been evolving that, that solution um, to a point now where the design that we install on a cell site has two antennas. Um, one of those antennas covers all of the legacy technologies. So it covers 2G, it covers 3G and it covers 4G and all of the different frequency bands that we would use on those different technologies. And then we have a single 5G antenna, which is this massive MIMO antenna, which, uh, which we use solely for, for 5G. Um, now, one of the big challenges that we're facing at the moment, and it's probably something that a lot of people will relate to, um, especially in the world of technology, is that, is that there's a constant evolution on these, on these new massive MIMO antennas. Uh, and even if I go back two years to when we first rolled out 5G, the amount of development that's happened on those massive MIMO uh, antennas is, has been enormous um, to the point where we've now got um, uh, um, antennas with half the number of, um, uh, which, which has got half the, half the number of ports on it, um, sorry, not the half number of ports. Um, we had, we had um, 64 by 64 um, massive mine panels. We're now down to 32 by 32, which offer the same performance. So, so we're basically getting the same performance um, out, out of half of the, of the nodes on the, on the antenna. Um, 
not only that, but the weight is reducing. So we find ourselves in a situation of, of never quite knowing or, or, or having to have some difficult, difficult decisions to make in terms of which actual solution to start rolling out, because there's always something that's better coming behind. It's a little bit like the challenge you have when buying laptops because you know whatever you buy will be out of date within six months or if you're buying a tv you know that will be out of date within within a year um it's the same problem that, that we have um fast moving technology but we have to make some decisions and go with go with something um which we think will give us the the most longevity we've also got challenges of of additional spectrum auctions happening which has increased the amount of spectrum being available um, for us to use on 5g and some of the early equipment that was available doesn't support all of those frequency bands so 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 some of the operators right now have got equipment which doesn't support all of the spectrum that they want to deploy um, and we've also got new technology um, available now which means that some of the equipment that we that, that was brand new rolled out two years ago is almost now redundant so challenging times but um, it makes for for an exciting environment so what is uh what does a cell site look like once it's uh done and dusted so here's here's a couple of photographs from one of our central london uh, cell sites um the picture on the right shows the antennas um as you can see there are three and well, there's three antennas that, that you're viewing um, in the main part of the, of the of the picture there. There's actually nine on the um, on that uh, stub mast. There's three antennas per sector. We, we generally configure cell sites um, with three sectors on them. Uh, the middle antenna is for our sharer partner in London, uh, which is O2. So that's their antenna. And the antenna on the left that you can see is our legacy antenna, so that covers the 2G, 3G, 4G, and then the smaller antenna on the right-hand side is the massive, massive MIMO. Um, seems a bit odd to call it massive MIMO when it's less than half the size of the other antennas, but um, that's, that's just the way it it uh, it's been it's been called. And and that, of course, is um, is is extremely heavy. That's that's about 60 kilograms in weight. So what? powers all of that so um downstairs in a in a room in this building um is the photograph on the left and and this is where you can see all the different radios that are um serving this the cell site here um, the different radios literally are different frequencies um from 800 megahertz um which will be our our low band um up to 2.6 gigahertz, which would be some of our higher bands on 4G. Of course, the radios for the 5G are on the back of the antenna, so they're not actually down in the uh, equipment room here. Um, as you can see, there's um, there's a, a nice piece of um, uh, rigging going on within this room. It's all very neat and tidy um, and, uh, and, and shows just how it should be done. And of course, if you go around looking at cell sites or you get the opportunity to go onto cell sites, especially in some of the uh, the best cities in, in the UK, you get some absolutely amazing views. Uh, the, some of these photographs, certainly the one top left is on top of St. Thomas's Hospital, looking down the river there. Um, the bottom left is also St. Thomas's, looking towards the London Eye. I'm not entirely sure um, what the top right one is and the photograph on the bottom right is on Whitehall. Um, you can just see the antennas which are on top of that building there on Whitehall and um, which is a, a new 5G installation that was, um, that was uh, installed. So that's how we go about building it. Um, it's been a bit of an architectural evolution, certainly, to get to 5G. Um, we've got a lot more spectrum. We've got massive MIMO panels, um, which can do beam forming. Uh, we've got um, an ability to do carrier aggregation, which basically allows 
phones or customers to connect to the network using more than one frequency band um, to, to, to really push through high, high volumes of data really, really quickly. And we're starting to see re reducing latency on the network as well, which is, which is coming down considerably. And then lots of new architectural en enablers as well, um, like uh, NFV, which is Network Function Virtualization, Software-Defined Networks, Mobile Edge Computing, and, and Network Slicing. Um, so lots of, lots of big games and gains in terms of how we uh, use data, how we manage data in the network, how we operate the network, and, and, how, we, and how we configure it. So, you know, really, really great advances um, here. But what's, what's it all in aid of, I, I, I guess? Uh, uh, what are the trends? What, what's driving the, the need for, for 5G? Well, I guess four main things really that, that we've been seeing. And, and certainly, uh, as long as I can remember, traffic growth, data traffic growth, certainly on the mobile network has been growing exponentially. And um, we've seen um, certainly over the last three or four years, tr uh, data traffic growing at uh, in excess of 1% a week in some cases, um, but certainly over a year, um, somewhere between 60% and 100% growth per year. So huge increases in the amount of demand on the network. Uh, lots of new services uh, coming along, whether that's 4K TV, there's now 8K TV, there's uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, um, smart cities, connected this, connected that. Um, which is all driving a, a, a data hungry world, whether that's consumers or, or whether that's businesses. And then lots and lots of new business cases coming along, um, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, later, but um, more and more functionality driving more and more data. And of course, we're living in an in a, in a increasingly digitalized uh, world where um, we're accessing a, a whole manner of different uh, different media and content online, whether it's films on Netflix, whether it's um, uh, uh, cloud storage on the likes of Dropbox or on Amazon Web Services, accessing music on demand. Um, and of course, you know, businesses are using all, a whole manner of different applications, which are, are all hosted on the, on the cloud and, and online. So all of this is, is just driving a need and a demand for, for, for more and more data. The good news is that 5G largely serves to meet a lot of those needs. Um, what 5G gives us is, is significantly more capacity on the networks. Um, the, the, the blocks of spectrum that have been auctioned for 5G are, are a lot, lot bigger than, than what we've had on, on previous technologies. And most operators in the UK now have got circa 100, 100 megahertz of, uh, of, of bandwidth. Um, and by having the, that extra bandwidth and combined with the bandwidth that we've got on, on the legacy technologies on 4G, um, we've now got a, a, a huge capacity to be able to support this, this growing need. Um, and with that capacity, we've also got that capability to deliver faster and faster data rates. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I think there's, there's examples around the world now where 5G networks are achieving one gigabit per second uh, on a mobile phone, which is quite, quite honestly, it's, it's astonishing because I, I remember back probably in the early days of 3G, which is only 20 years ago, when one megabit per second on a mobile device felt like it was an amazing experience. But, but also, as well as capacity and bandwidth, um, uh, there's also this thing called latency that everybody's talking about in relation to, to 5G. And, and, and the latency is becoming a, a, a clear driver for um, uh, many of the 5G use cases. Um, 
and and what we're starting to see now is certainly as we move into a 5G standalone environment where we can start to put um, content out into the network, closer into the network, uh, and provide mobile edge computing, then we, we then start to reduce the round trip delays um, considerably, which allows lots and lots of new use cases, which rely heavily on, on, a, on a very uh, low latency or a very quick uh, uh, turnaround on, on, uh, on responses. And the final thing is is around slicing, and 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 I I guess I I count slicing as as being one of two things. One is where we can provide a slice on 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 a nor on on the network to a consumer to a business, and it, and it basically gives a guaranteed amount of bandwidth and a guaranteed grade of service. Um, but if you take that to the extreme, um where an, a number of, of businesses are moving now, and especially in the world of manufacturing and robotics and, uh, and, and uh, factories, uh, going towards a um, MPN, which stands for Mobile Private Network, where people will actually install 5G networks into their factories and operate um, uh, um, manufacturing and, and, and all sorts of, of uh, factory activities can be managed on a on a 5G network. Um, what this does is it is it gives you know huge amount of flexibility and agility in being able to reconfigure um, those uh, uh, those processes. Um, and also there's there's a huge um, number of um, uh, health and safety benefits that come with this as well because um, with the very low latency any any issues which are detected on, or can be can be stopped very very quickly um, using using 5g so the basic capabilities really of 5g is is about an enhanced mobile broadband and and, and whether that's a capability that that you have on a virtual reality headset or on some um, some glasses. Um, we're yet to see whether the whether the virtual reality glasses will actually take off. I suspect at some point they probably will, um, or or whether that's for um, a, a, as an alternative to a fixed home broadband service. Um, we certainly see lots and lots of high capacity, high, high throughput type um, uh, use cases um, making the most of, of 5G. And as I said before, mission critical communications, whether that's factories, robotics, um, whether that's managing um, uh, uh, something like a port operation um, or, or, or a, a warehouse environment, um, the um, critical communications and, 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 and critical robotics and uh, in those situations uh, are lend themselves beautifully to, to, to be able to be managed by 5G where decisions and actions can be can be managed very very quickly. And of course lots and lots of talk about autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, um, the use of drones on 5G, the use of connected ambulances, uh, on all sorts of different connected devices, um, which can be which can be managed on a on a five G network, and then finally there's massive IoT, which is which is really about managing millions and millions of different devices, whether that's from from the very simple and basic sensor that would be on a water meter, which would report a water meeting a water meter reading every once a month or something. Um, up to uh, sensors on on uh, uh, on on street lighting, um, sensors, a whole manner of different sensors that we can use in cities for parking, for air pollution, for traffic management, um, that can be connected onto a five G network and, and managed in a in a very safe uh, in, in a very safe way. So this is this is kind of what it looks like, I think, in terms of the opportunities, where if we look at uh, network latency along the x-axis and, and network speed on the on the y, 
Um, the real area where 5G is going to come into its own right is, is in this top right hand corner um, where we've got things like FWA, which stands for fixed wireless access. That's basically a home broadband service delivered over 5G. Um, so this is a, a massive opportunity for some, some rural areas where uh, the cost of, of uh, deploying fibre is, um, is prohibitive. We can, we can look at how we use a 5G capability to connect homes to, uh, on a, on a, with an external antenna to a 5G network and they can, they can be offered a, a really strong, fast, reliable um, broadband service. Uh, and then there's various other items on there, um, such as cloud, cloud robotics, drone surveillance, ambulances, uh, um, virtual reality, augmented reality. Gaming, I think, will be, will be a huge play in, in the future. I, I'm not personally not a gamer, but um, uh, I, I know that those that game uh, constantly moan about uh, what they call lag. Um, lag is, is effectively the same as, as latency. It's, it's the delay between them pressing a button on a controller and getting a response from the game. Um, gaming experiences become so much more realistic and immersive if we can reduce that, um, that latency uh, or that lag that, that, that they experience. Uh, and then, you know, even bottom right, where, where network speed isn't particularly important, but, um, but the network latency is really important. So you've got factories um, managing, managing, you know, smart grids, uh, gaming uh, on, on the go, which, which would probably be, be a, a lower, lower um, speed and augmented reality gaming. Uh, so those are those are the the areas that that um, certainly we see there to be opportunities. But you know, every every day, every month, every 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 year, there are more and more um, ideas and opportunities coming along from from the various um, incubation centres that has been set up around the UK and around the world that are looking at how we make best use out of out of five G technology. So we've got autonomous vehicles. Um, we definitely see 5G playing a major part in how vehicles um, operate in certainly in cities um, where all the safety critical driving functions um, can be monitored by the car itself and responses can, can be, be considerably shortened. Um, if you think about, you know, just latency in its own right and sensors on cars being able to detect cars in front braking, um, you know, that could that that can save lives if if uh, if the cars can make instant decisions without without the human brain having to having to react to what's happening around. Um, health is a, is a huge area where um, remote surgery um, will, will definitely play a role in, in the future. Um, there's already trials of this happening. Remote surgery has already happened. Um, certainly Vodafone are working with a hospital in, um, uh, in Cardiff right now where, where they're looking to do some cancer surgery, um, which, will, which will be done partially re remotely uh, and, and given uh, giving an opportunity for other people to learn about about how surgery is performed, how intricate surgery is performed. Um, video sur surveillance, connected factories. We're, we're already looking at a number of different um, situations where where different organisations are moving to private networks to operate car uh, car plant manufacturing, um, and certainly um, the, there's there's huge interest from port authorities on how they manage the operations of ports using 5G technology to, um, to manage all the different uh, um, containers and ships moving in and out, um, which can be a, a very complex process. Drones, of course, are, are much talked about. Um, there's already um, drones operating, um, delivering medical supplies in rural parts of the country, which can be delivered in the likes of 30 minutes, 
um, rather than potentially 48 hours as it would normally take. And then there's smart cities, and 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 I think I think when it comes to smart cities, the 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 list is almost endless in terms of the possibilities of managing lighting, street lighting, bin collections, um, monitoring uh, utilities, um, monitoring uh, uh, water leakage from 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 utilities, and uh, monitoring the temperature of ducts um, that have got electricity cables going through them. Um, monitoring parking, parking availability, monitoring uh, uh, um, pollution in the air. Uh, it, the list goes on and on and on. And, and, the, and this is the opportunity where 5G can manage millions and millions of devices um, which, um, you know, which all want, want to talk and, and stay connected. And we're certainly seeing an awful lot of interest from lots of different local authorities and, and large cities in terms of how how they can use uh, harness 5G to to you know to help them with their smart city ambitions. I spoke earlier about um, about network slicing and about private networks, and and I guess I see this this slide here kind of almost takes you through the uh, the scale of different levels of 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 how a network can can support different enterprises where you've got far left you've got just just the, the normal public network um which provides um all the access required um the the uh, edge computing is available um but that's available to everybody on the network um, some businesses will want to move to in building solutions for, for where they need dedicated uh, and complex uh, solutions to be solved and they don't want to be at the mercy of everybody else who's on the network and what bandwidth they're taking off it. Um, and then we start to move to, you know, to, to hybrid solutions which um, do have a, a level of, of dedication within the building but are also connected to the external network and, and offer that flexibility where you can move between the public network and the and the private network. Or, or alternatively, uh, as I mentioned before, um, it is possible once we once we move into the uh, in, in about two years time, we can start to offer slices as a capability for for businesses. Uh, what, what what would be an example of that? An example of that would be potentially a broadcaster uh, covering a live event from uh, a particular location where 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 they don't have the backhaul capability, and um, they could buy a buy a slice of bandwidth off a five G network, which would be dedicated to that broadcasting company. Um, they know how much bandwidth they'll get. Um, and how much they need, and and that's then locked in and available to them for the period of their broadcast. Um, and we we definitely see see that as being as being something which is of use. Alternatively, that could be something like the Metropolitan Police, um, who require dedicated bandwidth to police a particular event or or uh, a situation where they need to have um, all of their communications available to them without any fear of of um, the network being overloaded by other users. Um, let me just move on to to talk about a few few different areas where where there's already some some activity. Um, rural Dorset is um, uh, uh, an area where um, we're we're working with with the, the council to look at how we can use 5G for a fixed wireless access. So so this is an alternative to to fixed broadband. Um, lots of work going on with the West Midlands 5G group around um, how how 5G can support autonomous vehicles um, and all the different opportunities around car sensors connecting cars together. Um, and 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 how that how that can can work in the, in in the world in the in the future. We've been working with Coventry University around how we um, uh, deliver a standalone network 
um, and and they're looking at, at how they start to then use 5G as a as a means of offering um, online uh, lectures and on, online tutoring. Uh, I mentioned earlier about Cardiff University, um, and this is where we've been looking at um, supporting them on uh, an application for um, uh, augmented reality bowel cancer screening um, and, and also some surgery as well. And then all of the utility uh, organisations are looking at, at, at um, what, what are the op opportunities for, for 5G um, and how taking a slice of a 5G network can guarantee um, their operations um, regardless of what's happening with everybody else on, on the network. Um, and I mentioned ambulances before where um, connected ambulances um, can, can provide, you know, really, really important immediate health care to uh, uh, critical patients as a result of accidents, road accidents, whatever, um, before they're actually delivered to the hospital. Um, and that allows the, the, the teams in the hospitals to stay in direct contact with, um, with the patient in the ambulance and make sure that, that the best care is, is administered before they get, get to the, uh, uh, the hospital. So um, it doesn't stop here, though. It's um, it's a never-ending evolution on on five G, and and quite honestly, we're still in the very early stages. The standards will continue to evolve over the over the coming years. New functions, new features will come along. The next big thing that we're going to start to see is a move to a 5G standalone solution. Um, currently, we use a non-standalone solution, which is anchored off a 4G network. So the 5G will be uh, um, stand, uh, standing on its own uh, in effect. Um, and that's when we can really start to exploit the opportunities uh, with mobile edge computing uh, and, and some of the new functionality around slicing, which will come uh, uh, along later. Um, we've also got um, mobile private networks, um, which, which will be available um, in the next year or so. Um, and, um, and as we move um, into around about 2023 in the next couple of years, um, there potentially is more spectrum being offered in the millimetre wave band, um, which offers huge bandwidths. And um, in theory, we, we've got capabilities of um, downlink speeds approaching um, 10 gigabits per second, which um, quite honestly seem, seem unreal um, in, this, in this day and age that, that we could achieve that on a, on a mobile device. But um, I guess if I rewind to 2000, um, when it was one megabit per second, then um, uh, it's not particularly surprising. That's where we're going to. That's where we're going to end up. So that was that was all the the slides that that I I had for you this evening. Uh, but before I finish, um, I'd like to to share um, a Vodafone promotional video. Um, I, I'm not showing it to promote Vodafone in, in the slightest. I'm showing it to promote. Um, the industry um, to promote the um, the power of connectivity, I guess, and, and showing really what is possible in making people's lives better and more fulfilled. Um, this is just one example of how 5G can help a small group of people, but there's no end of similar applications and use cases which will come along in the future uh, to help uh, and assist the vulnerable uh, and the less well-off to live better lives. Uh, it's stuff like what you're about to see in this next video that makes me proud to have been associated with this industry for over 30 years. Uh, and, and when I look back over my time, um, you know, when I, when I retire, I, I, it, will, it, it will be with immense satisfaction about how we've moved the dial on, on what the world looked like when I first graduated um, and we had um, the very first analog phones um, and those, those huge bricks to, to where we will be 
um, you know, in the next five, five or six years. So I hope um, I hope you find this this video um, interesting. Um, I have to confess it, it generally brings a tear to my eye um, every time I watch it, and I've watched it a lot of times. Um, so so hopefully um, it will make a similar connection with yourselves. But but really, it's for me it it, it encapsulates you know what um, connectivity. Can, can bring to mankind and, and how it can help people. So I'll play this video and then we will move to some questions. Als ich zwölf war, fing es an. Ich verlor langsam meine Sehkraft. Mit 18 war ich dann fast blind. Mein Name ist Noemi Ristau, ich bin blinde paralympische Skifahrerin. Heute fahre ich allein die Piste runter. Die Augenkrankheit, die ich habe, heißt Morbus Stargard, was ein längerer Prozess war zu lernen, dass ich viele Dinge einfach nicht machen kann oder darf, wie Autofahren. Aber danach habe ich es einfach auch als Herausforderung genommen und ich möchte die Sachen, die ein Sehender kann, möchte ich genauso auch können. Noemi und ich sind auf jeden Fall ein Team. Das, was wir machen, ist eine Teamsportart. Normalerweise fahren wir zusammen. Ich fahre voraus und gebe Noemi Anweisungen über ein Headset. Du musst mir immer blind vertrauen können. Noemi wird heute alleine die Piste runterfahren und ich gebe ihr die nötigen Kommandos von einem Kontrollraum aus. Dank der neuen 5G-Technologie fast in Echtzeit. Die Live-Bilder von der Strecke bekomme ich vom Huawei Mate 20 Pro auf Noemis Helm. Okay Noemi, es geht los. Bist du bereit? Ich bin bereit. 3, 2, 1, ready, go! Schieb, schieb! Und hopp! Und hopp! Und hopp! Steilstück! Und hopp! Hopp! Hocke! Hopp! Und hopp! Und gerade, gerade! Hocke, 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 hocke! Das Gefühl war unglaublich, unten anzukommen und zu merken, ich kann einfach alleine da runterfahren und bin im Ziel sicher und heile angekommen. Und auf jeden Fall war das ein Gefühl von Freiheit, da alleine runterzufahren. Okay, um, hope you enjoyed that. Sorry, I meant to mention it was in German, um, but hopefully you were able to follow the subtitles. Um, so happy to take uh, any questions now. Shall I stop sharing my screen? No, it's uh, okay. Uh, uh, you yeah, can okay. carry on sharing. Uh, we have quite a few questions and I'll try and group some together. Okay. Um, so uh, we, we have a couple of related ones here. One from Mike Underhill and one from uh, Rosemary McGlation. Um, Mike says, well, what is the range of 5G from the antenna and what is the expected time lag for rural 5G? And, and Rosemary really asks, you know, how close together the antenna need to be. And I guess it's sort of re re the two are related. Yeah, yeah. OK, um, so the the frequency that we've been using for the initial deployments of 5G um, is in the 3.4 gig band. Um, the massive MIMO antennas allow us to get quite a good level of gain um, coming out of the antenna. Um, so we're basically okay to use it on the existing grid that we have in the major cities. Now, the, the grid um, is, is a, an adaptive site to site distance. So the cell sites in the center of London uh, and the center of, of major cities are a lot closer together. And as we start to go out, 
they they get wider apart. Now that that happens for two reasons. One is capacity, um, because we 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 you know as as we go closer into the center of the cities, the traffic becomes more dense, the data demands become more dense, but also the propagation of the signal um, is much more reduced because there's so much more clutter and there's more buildings. So um, in central London, we've got cell sites, you know, I don't know, 200, 200 meters apart. Uh, two two three hundred meter, meters apart, and then as we go out further into the into the suburbs, um, we start to get out to about one point five kilometers apart. Um, now we won't use the three point five, sorry, three point four gig spectrum to deliver five G much outside of of busy suburban areas, um, and we'll we'll use other frequencies. Um, as they become available to deliver 5G to rural. Now, the latest spectrum auctions auctioned off 700 megahertz, um, which um, will be used by most of the operators to deliver um, rural 5G. Uh, Vodafone didn't actually uh, buy any 700 megs. And the reason for that is we've already got some low band spectrum at a slightly different, different frequency. Um, but we should start to see those uh, 5G rolled out into rural areas. I would have thought from probably next year onwards, um, quite where it will appear first and, and how it will be rolled out, I, I, I guess, is down to individual operators. But, but I would say certainly from, from 22 onwards in the rural areas. Does that answer the questions? Uh, yeah, I think so. Thank you, Kerr. Um, a question from An Andrew Kelleher. Uh, does the large capacity of 5G mean the end of cable networks for voice telephony? <laughs> um, does it mean the end? Um, possibly. Um, I, I, I guess... Um, there's a there's an ever decreasing use of um, fixed line telephony now. Um, I for one haven't had a fixed line in my home for many many years now, and I know quite a lot of people in a similar situation. But for many people, you know, they they like the security of having a a a, a physical connection into the home. Um, but I guess as 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 time moves on and 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 different generations come through, that reliance of on a fixed connection and and that maybe those those old fashioned views on on it being fixed um, become diminished and and people care less about it and are quite happy to rely on on everything being wireless. Um, so I, I suspect yes, it's it's. There's probably the end is is there, but but exactly when I I don't honestly know, but uh, definitely I, I don't know what the stats are. I don't know what this the the numbers are, but I would have thought the number of um, home phones are are reducing at quite a considerable rate um, in terms of fixed line. Yeah, and certainly I find both our children. Uh, don't have a fixed line. They rely on yeah, fixed yeah. Line. I th I think it might be driven by a sort of generational type approach. Um, certainly, um, the generations behind me who've grown up with mobiles all through their life, I'm not even sure they know what to do with a f with a fixed line phone. Um, so, so I think that will probably kill it more than the technology itself. It's more, it's more of a sort of a generational thing. On the, some of the subjects of phasing out of things, David Boyd asks, are there plans to phase out 2G, 3G or 4G? Uh, well, there are plans to phase out 3G. So 3G will be the first technology that we actually um, remove. Um, and we're, we're, we're sort of looking at our plans for that at the moment. Um, the reason that that will go before um, 2G is that there's a lot of 2G machine to machine um, devices out there that, that, that aren't easily um, removed. Um, so I think all of 
the smart meter um, sims are configured on 2G. Um, so we've got we've got millions of those out there, and 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 those are going to be quite challenging to to remove. Lots and lots of um, IoT sensors which are on 2G as well, which need to be swapped out. So that that's really what's holding back as removing the 2G network. Um, the 3G network, there's less and less. Uh, I mean, 3G. Sorry, David. I know your your iPhone is a is a 3G device, but it, it's probably not much good for data um, because uh, the 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 data capability on 3G is 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 pretty minimal. And we've now got uh, a capability for 4G on voice called Volte, um, which is much much superior to to 3G. And and of course. Um, uh, it um, it also allows you to uh, browse and use and use your data at the same time that you're on a call. So we're seeing more and more people moving to more modern phones that support Volte and less and less people using 3G to make phone calls. So I would say, you know, a couple of years we'll start to see 3G shutting down um, um, by all of the networks um, and 2G uh, yeah, I, I'm. I'm not even. I'm not even aware of anybody talking about an exact timeline for that. But that would be next. Um, I think 4G will be around for some time yet. Um, for I mean, a lot of the stuff I spoke about in my presentation can be done on 4G actually. Um, and I and I you know I don't like to be dismissive of 4G because it's a great technology and it can deliver an amazing performance for a, for an awful lot of things. So I think it'll be here for some time yet. Right. But the order will go 3G, then 2G, then 4G. Thanks, Kurt. We have two questions from Phil Rudd. Um, they're, they're sort of related, but I'll ask each one individually. Uh, first of all, he says, as frequency goes up, so does signal attenuation. Mm -hmm. Does this not mean that you need more antenna installations so could this not prove problematical? Yeah, exactly. Um, so as frequency goes up, attenuation goes up. And that's why um, we can really only use the um, those higher frequency bands for urban areas where we've got the cell site density that would actually work for those for those distances. Um, and, and that's why we that's why even today on 4G, we have a number of different frequency bands and we use them all for different things. So, for example, on 4G, we've got an 800 megahertz uh, band. Uh, we've got a 2100 megahertz band and a 2600 band. We've also got a 1400 band as well. And so we use the 800 as the base coverage layer. And, and that's the layer that gets the coverage out and uh, uh, widespread into rural areas. Um, it's also the layer that allows us to get inside of buildings as well. And then in the hotspot areas, then we start to add the higher frequencies. And these frequencies pick up traffic closer to the cell site because it hasn't got the same amount of range. So we use them as capacity layers um, and we use the lower frequencies as the coverage layers. So we've effectively got a multi-layer and network and we'll use the same on on 5g because a lot of those frequencies that we use today on 3g and on 4g they will be refarmed into 5g in the future and we'll we'll do the same again we'll use the low frequencies for the wide area coverage in the in building and the higher frequencies for the high capacity high dense high density areas um phil's other question is uh, does each antenna connect to the internet requiring a fiber connection or do they talk to each other with only a one in n antennas connected to fiber sorry could you just say that again it's really saying that it does each antenna have its own fiber connection into yeah. the, the the network or or do multiple antennas connect by, uh, together yeah. by a each each cell site has its own fiber so we we basically come each cell site has got three sectors so three cells if you like um and three three antennas uh, and they're generally spaced 120 degrees apart 
that give us the 360 coverage. And they, they are all connected together through one fiber from that individual cell site. So, so three cells are combined into, into one fiber connection. Um, and and that, that will generally be connected on a one, one gig uh, backhole circuit and, and in some cases 10 gigs. Right. Um, now, uh, someone called Ed uh, said, uh, could some of the antenna equipment be placed in the basement of buildings? Now, I guess within building uh, systems, that may be something that would be done. Uh, for in-building, yeah, I mean, in-building solutions where we've got um, really difficult buildings to get coverage into, we put in-building systems in and put the antennas inside the buildings, in the, in the vaults above the ceiling um, um, or, or on the walls. Um, if you go into Heathrow Airport, for example, or any of the large airports, we've got, we've got in-building systems and there's that, that in, in those types of environments, shopping centres as well, railway stations, um, where, where we radiate the signal from inside the building. Um, and, that, and that allows us to, A, dedicate that, that capacity for, for those particular locations. And, and, and it also means that we don't lose any of the signal penetrating in, into the building because, you know, things like, you know, Heathrow Terminal 5, for example, is, is, is a very high loss building for a radio wave. So it's, it's absolute complete waste of time trying to, trying to penetrate it from outside. A lot of modern construction uses quite highly reflective glass. Um, and we can typically see somewhere in the region of 30, even 40 dBs of attenuation through, through the construction. Um, so, you know, reflective glass and steel is, is, is a nightmare. It, it might as well be a Faraday cage, quite honestly. Okay, we have a, uh, a question from Chris Horsfield. It's, so we've all seen uh, and, and around and he asks, well, why are antennas mounted vertically? Um, because, it's, uh, because it's a vertically polarised um, and antenna signal that's that's uh, that's radiated. All right. Okay. So just as we see TV aerials, some of them uh, with the, the, the segments uh, vertically and some with horizontally, due to the different polarization of the signals from different transmitters. It, it's you're saying all the uh, signals are all the signals of uh, the, the, the dipoles are are mounted vertically with it are generally with it. Uh, um, why would they? Because also, actually, that's probably not the best answer. I think the best answer is because if we want to, yeah, it's it's about how the the arrays are phased to create the the beam, um, and if they're stacked horizontally, you're able to then phase the signals into the into the uh, um, um, different elements to create a antenna pattern which which points down and, and 120 degrees. If they were phased vertically um, you just wouldn't be able to achieve the antenna pattern that you want for a cellular antenna. Right. Yeah, thanks Kurt. Um, there's, a, there's a question from Anthony Seaman and uh, those of us that live in Sussex uh, will often have travelled up the M23 and noticed um, a rather peculiar looking tree uh, which happens to be a, a mobile mask, a mast. Um, and so uh, Anton is asking, uh, uh, <laughs> is there... I know the one, I know the one. Yeah, what, what can be done about uh, uh, some of these uh, antennas, making them look uh, less obvious? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm open. To, I'm, I'm, I'm really open to, to sort of people's views on this. I mean, we've tried all sorts of different things from these these tree um, uh, uh, tr towers that are disguised as trees, um, which have varying success with local planning authorities. Some some of them are quite okay with them. Some of them despise them. 
um, they're actually massively expensive to deploy. Um, so so we, we tend not to uh, do too many of those, uh, but in really sensitive areas we, we have. Um, th there's a whole manner of different things being tried in, in urban environments by putting antennas against the side of, of buildings and painting them to look like brickwork. We also mount a lot of antennas behind uh, GRP as well, um, which is uh, radio transparent. Um, in fact, that picture I showed you of um, Whitehall, the antennas are actually behind a GRP panel on that cell site there. And that was a planning condition from Westminster um, that, that most of the antennas weren't visible. So we put them behind a GRP uh, sheet. So we can use that. In rural areas, you're kind of limited to tree, tree type structures, or we've also used pylons as well to put antennas on, um, which, which kind of doesn't really add to the, to the clutter, I guess, um, because the pylon's already cluttering the, uh, uh, the eye line anyway. Um, so using existing structures where we can. And also, you know, all mobile operators try and share structures as much as possible. So as we avoid a proliferation of different masts everywhere. Um, but, but, you know, we're, we're, we're always looking at, at new ideas and, and, you know, open to suggestions. Uh, a question from Mike Sims, who, who says he, he got his first mobile phone in 2013 because without WhatsApp, uh, they were cut off from the kids' play school. Um, and he's wondering what you think might be the, uh, um, the use case that will drive the late adopters to buy their first 5G phone. EG getting switched off maybe, um, might, be, uh, might be one. Um, good question, good question. To get their first mobile phone, did you say? Yeah, or, yeah, or to, or to get 5G? 5G. Um, I don't know. It's really interesting. So what I see on the network is anybody who hasn't got 4G already isn't really using data. Or, or the data they're using is probably very, very minimal. Maybe the odd WhatsApp message, um, stuff like that. And, and the 5G data growth comes entirely from 4G. So it's completely substitutional. So everyone who's moving to 5G is effectively coming from 4G. So there's not a movement from people who are on 2G today or 3G today onto 5G. And I, and I guess... Maybe, maybe the, the, the move will be um, I guess closing down of the 3G network, which will probably happen in the next couple of years, might be a reason to, to do it. Um, but I think, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question, actually. Really good question. I don't know. One for you to ponder. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess, I guess moderate, you know, it's a bit like anything. It's a bit like TVs, you know, what, 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 what drives you ultimately to go from a CRT to a flat screen TV? Um, I, 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 I guess ultimately the performance becomes, becomes better. The, the, uh, the clarity on the TV gets better. It takes up less space. It uses less power. Do you know what I mean? It, it's kind of a combination of things. And I think with if you look at 5G handsets compared to, to some of the older 3G handsets, um, they're less bulky. The battery lasts a lot longer. The voice quality is better on 4G than it is on, on 3G. The call setup time is better. It means that you can have a call and use a data session at the same time. The drop call rate is much better on the higher technologies than the lower technologies. So it's like, it's an, it's an evolution of, of that mobile experience on the newer technologies. Some, it depends on how much you use it. So if I go back to the TV analogy, 
if you if you hardly ever watch TV, then you probably carry on. You won't see the need to update your TV. If you don't use your mobile much, you probably won't see the need to upgrade your your mobile device. Um, so it will be something that drives you to use your mobile more and appreciate it more that might 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 force you to invest in something which is which is uh, 4G or or maybe even 5G. Okay, well, a question from Ian Braithwaite. Um, he, he wonders how long was uh, 5G in development? In other, words, in other words, when were the first serious discussions? Yeah, I, I, th I think pretty much um, the evolution or, the, or, the, or the, the sort of development of each technology kicks off, you know, when the previous one is launched. So I know that 6G work has already started and it's probably been going for, for you know, a year or two now. Um, and we'd probably expect to see um, 6G appear, um, you know, towards the end of this decade. So I, I think they're probably a, 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 in and around from the very, very first development works, you know, best part of eight years, I would have thought. Um, from from conception to something that's commercially available on a on a network, because there's a, a process of developing different ideas. Um, apologies if you can hear my dogs barking. Um, um, there's a process from developing different ideas to then having the standards actually set and confirmed internationally. On what on what 6G would look like, and and that can take a very very long time, um, but the research and the and and the discussions will have started now, uh, eight years I would say something like that, quite long. Um, a couple of months ago, we had a talk from someone about uh, electromagnetic waves uh, and the effect that they have on on people or the effect they don't have on people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so Antonio Angola um, asks uh, if, there's, if there's any work really being done on, on the any potential health aspects of, of 5G with the uh, additional uh, transmissions. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is always a, a I guess it's quite a contentious area for some people. Um, probably the fear, the fear of the unknown. Um, most of the most operators, um, in fact, maybe even all operators, I'm, I'm not particularly sure here, um, have invested money into independent research on the on the long term effects of electromagnetic radiation. And um, that's been uh, a process which has been ongoing for many, many years now. Um, so you know that that's that's something that that we all support um, as an industry. Um, <clears throat> I think um, it's interesting. We we've, we've got a lot of noise currently around five G from from a lot of anti five G protesters. Um, that the source of that is mostly around the millimeter wave band. Um, which isn't in use in the UK today. Uh, it is in use in America. Um, and, and the concern there is that the higher frequency, um, albeit it's still non-ionizing, is closer to the, ioni I, the, the ionizing band. Um, but again, there's nothing to suggest that, that there, there's any issues with that. Um, lots and lots of research continues on the effects of non-ionizing radiation, um, and there's 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 nothing that has shown up yet to suggest that there's a significant risk. Now, um, there is a level of risk which I think the World World Health Organization reports, uh, and it categorizes all manner of different things into varying levels of of risk. Um, the the long term effects of non ionizing radiation from mobile phones is currently categorized the same level as drinking coffee, I believe. So, um, you know, 
that's a view from the World Health Organization. Um, everyone will have their own views on this, but I, I, I'd like to just talk very quickly about a story about back in the early days of rolling out 2G. Um, the company I was working for at the time um, were proposing to put a cell site in, uh, uh, in a lovely place in Hertfordshire called Harpenden, and we were going to put it on a water tower. And, and the residents were up in arms. They were furious about it. You know, they were, thought they were going to get, you know, microwaved. And um, so we commissioned an independent survey of um, the RF uh, in, in the town. And um, we set up a test transmitter on the water tower, which is where we wanted to put the cell site. And the conclusions from, from the survey showed us that the um, radiation levels um, from the radar at Luton Airport were some 10,000 times higher than any signal that you would have received off of a mobile phone mast. Um, I guess when we presented the findings, um, there was the the complaints kind of dissipated pretty quickly after that. Um, so I, I, I guess what am I trying to say? I'm, what I'm trying to say is there's been, there's, there's, there's a lot of radiation which is, which is out there and has been out there for, for many, many years, long before mobile phone masts. Um, the power transmitted by TV transmitters at Crystal Palace and, and, and various other locations are, are many hundreds of times, thousands of times higher than what you get off mobile phone signals, um, as, are the, as are the powers radiated by, by radar as well. So it's been around a long time uh, and, and some of the stronger signals, quite honestly, are from um, other equipment, which is, which is not connected to cellular. Okay, thanks, Gareth. I think we've only time really for one more question. Uh, my apologies to others who've asked questions that don't think, I, I think you've, you've covered quite a few of them in, in answering other questions. Uh, but Malcolm G um, has just put one word, uh, security, question mark. Um, is that in relation to, I don't know. <laughs> I'm assuming he's talking about uh, security of data that's being transmitted. Um, ah, okay, okay. Well, I mean, five five G is is uh, inherently way more secure than than any of the other uh, technologies. Um, goes without saying that as we evolve um, the the newer technologies, the the security improves. Um, if if there's a suggestion around. Um, the, the 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 decision around Huawei um, last year, um, then you know I, I can't really comment too much about that. I feel like it's largely a political decision to to remove that particular uh, vendor from the UK. Other countries have followed, and other countries have have made a decision to to stay with them. Um, uh, there are enormous um, requirements on us um, as part of the um, telecom security review, which happened recently, which are all being implemented into our networks. And you know, I'm I'm, I'm confident that um, you know we're we're achieving the highest standards on security of of data, taken very very seriously. Well, uh, quite a number of people who have asked questions have. Uh, in their opening uh, paragraph, uh, opening phrase, said thank you very much um, for, for, the, for an interesting talk. 